This is a world full of man-eating monsters. The monster eats half of the main character's body, and when he wakes up again, he finds himself living in his sister's body. From that day on, he has had some strange proclivities, often touching his body late at night and shyly staring at his body when taking a bath. To discover the secret of his body, he has to figure out what happened when he was in a coma. This world is divided into two parts by a wall. Outside the wall is a world ruled by monsters, and it turns into a waste ruin. In a world without laws, people have to face the crisis of food shortage and avoid being attacked by others. The world inside the wall is the heaven that everyone yearns for. It is said that the heaven has abundant food and a beautiful environment, and people here live a happy life. The story today will start here. A girl named Mimiheim tells a boy named Tokio that there will be a school exam today. Tokio doesn't believe her words, because if there is really an exam, the school will notify them in advance. Unexpectedly, the next moment, Mimiheim's words come true, and the school really notifies that a temporary exam will be held. During the exam, Tokio sees a strange question on the screen. It says, do you want to go outside? The question flashes by, and Tokio thought he misread it. As the exam is over, Tokio wonders how Mimiheim knew the exam time in advance, and she indicates that it was just her premonition. Tokio then tells her about the weird question he saw in the exam. Hearing it, Mimiheim takes Tokio to the wall, saying that she has been having a hunch that there is another world outside the wall. Recently, when she thinks about it, two figures will appear in her mind with one of them looking exactly like Tokio. Tokio grew up here, and he takes the walled area as the whole world. But after listening to what Mimiheim said, he falls into deep thought, and even suffers insomnia at night. So he comes to the wall again, only to be found by the principal. Tokio asks the question out of curiosity, is there really another world outside the wall? The principal thinks that Tokio will know the truth sooner or later, so she tells Tokio that there is indeed a world outside the wall, but it's just a filthy world with many ugly monsters. The scene then switches to the outside world. Fifteen years ago, an unprecedented catastrophe hit the world, leaving it devastated. A pair of siblings walk through the street. The older sister is named Karuko, and the younger brother is named Maru. From their conversation, we know that they are looking for heaven, but they don't know where it is exactly. Surprisingly, the brother Maru looks very similar to Tokio. The siblings haven't eaten for days, so when they find a house with a well-locked door, they expect to find some supplies inside. Sure enough, they found complete toilet paper after entering the house through the window. And Karuko happily pulls the weeds off the toilet. She has not used the toilet for a long time. It's just that the bathroom door is broken, so Maru accidentally sees Karuko on the toilet, which makes her angry. The two then continue to explore the house hoping to find some food, only to see skeletons of a couple who died with their hands clasped. It seems the two were starving to death, which means there is no food in the house. Fortunately, they soon find some cans in another house, and although Karuko isn't good at cooking, they get something into their stomach. The next day, not long after setting out, they encounter a group of ruffians. In a world without legal restrictions, girls will be very miserable if they are caught by them. Maru immediately fights with these ruffians, and it can be seen that he is skilled and agile as the several ruffians are no match for him. Just then, Karuko takes out a special pistol and fires a laser beam, which directly melts the telegraph pole on the side. Seeing this, the ruffians immediately raise their hands in surrender. Karuko inquires about heaven from them, getting to know about a place full of tomatoes which is called heaven by tomato lovers, and Karuko decides to visit that place. Then Karuko threatens the ruffians to hand over a battery, and when they see Karuko put the battery into the bottom of the pistol, they realize the pistol just had the energy replenished. Though angry, they can only watch Karuko and Maru leave. On their way, Karuko and Maru talk about their age. Maru says he is 15 years old while Karuko isn't sure about her age, just saying she's around 20. Soon after, they stumble upon a hotel still in operation. In a collapsed world, money is useless, so Karuko gives some batteries to the hostess to show gratitude for her taking them in. Karuko then asks if the hostess has any information about heaven, along with showing pictures of two men, hoping to know their whereabouts as the two men are important to Karuko. However, the hostess knows nothing about the men or heaven. Karuko is not disappointed about the answer, just taking Maru into the room and they are finally able to take a hot bath. Strangely, when Karuko sees herself naked body full of scars in the mirror, she looks a bit shy. Later, in the chat with the hostess, they learn that there will be dangerous monsters appearing at night. Instead of being scared, Karuko shows some excitement, saying that she has a special pistol that can shoot monsters, only to see a sudden gloomy expression on the hostess's face. But soon she returns to normal and prepares dinner for them. 
During the meal, the hostess reminds Maru and Karuko that it is not a good thing for siblings to have a child. The two immediately blush, and Karuko quickly explains that she and Maru are not siblings, let alone she has no interest in him, and that she is just a bodyguard Maru hired in Tokyo. As the misunderstanding is cleared up, Karuko and Maru go back to their room to rest. Maru is a little upset to know Karuko doesn't have an interest in him. It seems he has a crush on Karuko. Seeing how Maru reacts to what she said, Karuko tries to comfort him, only to fall into a coma before she can say a word. It turns out that the hostess has added a lot of sleeping pills to the food they ate. Meanwhile, we see the hostess pick up a shotgun, and a terrifying giant strange bird flies toward the hotel. When Karuko finally wakes up, she finds a man-eating monster outside the window, and she quickly awakens Maru. The two walk out of the room with weapons, and drink some water to dilute the sleeping pills in their bodies. Just then, the hostess discovers them, asking them to go back. Karuko guesses that the hostess was trying to keep them away from the monster so she added the sleeping pills to their food. At this moment, the giant bird shows up again. Karuko and Maru quickly chase after it. This huge monster looks very terrifying. It has no head, but a very sharp whip that can easily cut through a human body. Experienced in combat, Karuko and Maru soon keep the monster at disadvantage. Just as Karuko is about to give it a fatal shot, the hostess blocks the way and shouts, This is my child. It turns out that the monster ate the son of the hostess not long ago, and she thought since her son had entered the bird's body, the bird is her son now. She tells Karuko and Maru that the strange bird will not harm her and even helped her drive away other monsters not long ago. Just when Karuko believes what the hostess said and puts down her weapon, the monster directly cuts off the hostess with its whip and then eats her. This scene enrages the two. Maru wipes Karuko's tears and then rushes to the monster using all his strength to penetrate his arm into its body, directly crumbing its heart. It seems that Maru has the power unimaginable to ordinary people. As the battle ends, Karuko and Maru continue on their way early the next morning. They lament that maybe the hostess was telling the truth. The monster indeed inherited her son's personality in the beginning and protected her several times. It's just that it is a monster after all, and in the end, it would still hunt and eat people everywhere with the humanity destroyed, otherwise, the world would not fall into such a terrifying situation. They don't feel like discussing this topic, while just following the clues given by the ruffians to find heaven. After a long journey, they discover a farmland which they speculate to be the heaven full of tomatoes. Just then, Karuko asks Maru what his purpose is in going to heaven. Maru takes out a box, and according to him, someone asked him to go to heaven to find the one who looks exactly like him, and then inject the medicine in the box into his body, so that he can save many people. Hearing this, Karuko is caught in a memory where a severely injured woman begged her to escort Maru to heaven. They are then discovered by the nearby farmers who treat them warmly as children. From the locals, they get to know that after the catastrophe, villagers here rebuilt their homeland. First planting a lot of tomatoes and later other crops. Perhaps that's why it was called the heaven of tomatoes. As villagers here never show any surprise when they see Maru, Karuko believes there's nobody looking like him, thus it is not the heaven Maru is looking for. Figuring it out, the two are a little frustrated. Suddenly, Maru sees a box with a mark on it, and the mark appears to be the same as the one on Karuko's pistol. They then speculate that the special pistol should not be a product of this world, but may be related to the mysterious heaven. The two wonder how the box came about, but the villager only knows it was used to hold supplies when trading with Tokyo. As they can't find a clue to heaven, they decide to go back to Tokyo by sea. On the boat, Maru laments that since heaven cannot be found at all, he would like to farm with Karuko for the rest of his life. Maru then plucks up the courage to confess his feelings to Karuko and kisses her. Karuko struggles to push Maru away, and she then reveals her secret to Maru seriously. Although her body is a woman, her brain belongs to a man, so she is a man indeed. Her words seem to be unbelievable, but it is the truth. As Karuko starts to reveal her past, we are brought back to five years ago. Ten years had passed after the catastrophe, and humans had gradually adapted to the existence of man-eating monsters, beginning to rebuild their homes. The siblings Kariko and Haruki lost their parents, becoming orphans. They then found a human community, moved into the orphanage here, and lived by working in the electrocart racing industry. Kariko was a racer and would regularly compete in various races, supporting the children in the orphanage and her brother with her bonus. To keep the race running, the head of the racing association hired many orphans as security guards, and Haruki was one of them. One day, two gangsters were found sneaking into the arena with forged tickets, and Haruki was knocked down by the two gangsters when he tried to arrest them. After the catastrophe, it is difficult for the laws of this world to bind mankind. 
When the two gangsters were about to kill Haruki, a man named Robin appeared in time to save him and defeat the gangsters. After that, Robin told Haruki that when fighting, he couldn't just stare at the enemy, but must observe his surroundings and use all the tools at his disposal. He then left the credit of catching two gangsters to Haruki, who could thus receive the reward. Robin was a bit older than Haruki, and often took care of him as well as the other kids in the orphanage. Therefore, Haruki admired him a lot. Getting the reward, Haruki happily returned to the orphanage where there were some orphans about his age, and while they were chit-chatting, Kariko returned from a race. As she accidentally broke her arm, a bearded doctor followed her back. After Kariko went to have a rest, a kid at the scene secretly told Haruki that he had better not let Kariko get too close to the doctor, who was said to be secretly studying man-eating monsters and conducting human experiments according to Robin's investigation. At night while Haruki was sleeping, he noticed that Kariko was cold and asked her to sleep with him. When Kariko actually did this, Haruki was a little shy. At this moment, there was a noise downstairs. It turned out that a man-eating monster was found in this neighborhood, and a group of men were about to fight it. Haruki also followed with a gun made by himself. The scene then switches to Haruki training his gun shooting skills. It turned out the man-eater had been eliminated, but Robin was so angry at Haruki joining the fight. He lost his sister who was at Haruki's age when the catastrophe had just occurred, so he would pay extra attention and care to Haruki, hoping to keep him safe. Just then, Haruki noticed that it was almost 3 o'clock, and he hurried to watch his sister's race. To observe the racetrack better, he took out his binoculars to watch the game, only to find a transparent man-eater appearing at the end of the track. He was going to shout for help, but the race had started and the cheers of the people at the scene were so loud that nobody could hear his voice. Thinking that it would just take his sister a few minutes to reach the end line, he knew it was too late to inform others. So he took his gun, rushing to the place where the monster appeared. When encountering the monster, he shot it fiercely, only to find the strong defense man-eater unharmed. The brave boy then took out his dagger and rushed at the monster. However, not only did he not hurt the monster, but he was entangled by it and could not break free. After a few minutes, Kariko arrived at the end track, where she noticed a man-eating monster. She quickly stopped and notified the racer behind to call for help. As she was about to leave, she saw Haruki being held in the mouth of the monster. Kariko collapsed instantly. She shouted Haruki's name, drove her cart into the monster, and snatched Haruki's body from the monster. Perhaps the monster was full, so it didn't attack her and left. Sadly, only half of Haruki's body remained. Thinking that her brother would soon die, Kariko's mind was filled with their past, and her tears couldn't stop flowing. At this moment, the scene switches. It seems that someone was performing surgery on Haruki. He felt that he was in a nightmare, where his beloved sister has gone, while he was entangled by the man-eater. By the time Haruki finally woke up, he was in the hospital bed. He dragged his tired body out of the ward. When he saw his look in the mirror, he instantly went out of control. He couldn't believe he had changed into Kariko, shouting that he wanted to see his sister. The doctors quickly stepped forward to inject him with tranquilizers. The nurses thought that Kariko couldn't accept the loss of her brother, and thus believed herself to be Haruki. At this moment, Haruki had calmed down, and he asked them what happened after he fell into a coma. The nurses revealed to Kariko, who was actually Haruki, that when she and her brother were sent to the hospital, they were both dying. It was the bearded doctor who conducted the operation, bringing her back to life, but unfortunately, her brother died, and the doctor left after the surgery. Haruki was a little confused. He remembered seeing his sister crying, but surely alive before he fell into a coma. How could she be sent to the hospital with him? Haruki knew that nobody would believe that he was in his sister's body, but he was sure he must be Haruki, because he grieved the loss of his sister, and occasionally rejoiced in inheriting his sister's body late at night. His feelings for his sister seemed to be very special. Haruki decided to keep this secret to himself, and four months had passed by the time he fully recovered. Then, he intended to leave the hospital to find the truth about this matter. He remembered what an orphan had mentioned to him that Robin was investigating the identity of the bearded doctor, so he planned to go to Robin to see if he could get any clues. He went back to the electrocart racing place where he had worked, only to be told by the staff there that Robin might have been killed. It turned out that there had been frequent disappearances in the neighborhood recently, and Robin had also disappeared while investigating the issue. Haruki hurried back to the orphanage where he used to live, only to find that his companions had also left. A man living nearby told him the kids had lost their financial resources after Kariko and Robin left, so they had to move somewhere else, but no one knew exactly where they moved to. Disappointed, Haruki walked back to his room lay on the bed, and shedding tears. 
At this moment, Haruki thought of a key point. People here did not find Robin's body, and there was no definitive evidence that Robin was dead. Maybe Robin just went somewhere else. He believed that if he could find Robin or the doctor, he would know the truth. Therefore, he found pictures of the two, and changed his name to Karuko. He presented himself as a bodyguard, protecting his employers while following them everywhere to find Robin and the doctor. For years passed by like this until Karuko met Maru. Karuko's incredible past shocks Maru, but in a world full of monsters, nothing is impossible. So Maru believes what Karuko says. It's just that he doesn't know if he should still call Karuko sister. Just as they're still troubled by how to appropriately call each other, a scream comes from a man nearby. Karuko and Maru run over to check and are taken aback. A terrifying man-eating fish monster appears outside the boat. But that's where the video ends. Let me know in the comments if you want me to cover part 2, and if you enjoyed watching this video, consider liking and subscribing for more like it. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you next time.